Welcome to church this morning. We've got a special guest who will be bringing the word this morning. His name is Pastor Jim Gallagher. He's come all the way over from Vero Beach. Would you please give him a warm Rock Calvary Chapel welcome. I've got to see if I can manage the microphone. I struggled last service, so the on switch was difficult for me. So, well, I'm blessed to be here. I'm here with my wife, Christy, and uh, it's a joy to be here. Um, and uh, it was really a joy. Uh, Christy was here um, a little over a month ago speaking at uh, the Christmas event for the ladies. And uh, that's when we discovered that uh, your uh, new worship pastor, uh, Neil, was here. And uh, we've known Neil and his wife for years. I uh, met Neil over 20 years ago at Calvary Merritt Island, and then uh, we knew them through ministry that we'd be involved in over in Eastern Europe, and so what a blessing to see them again, and I think you guys are truly blessed having them part of the, of the ministry here. So, um, well, hey, uh, this morning, I want to talk to you on the subject of the grace of God, and I'd like you to turn to two places in your Bible as we look at it. The first one is John chapter 1, John chapter 1, and then the second is 2 Timothy chapter 2. So John chapter 1 and 2 Timothy chapter 2. And once again, we'll be talking about the grace of God. In John chapter 1, John is going to use a, a very interesting term to describe Jesus. If you take a look at verse 14, John says, and the word became flesh. So when the, the Bible, in order to help us understand who God is or who Jesus is, the Bible uses a host of different titles to describe him. And each title reveals a different aspect of his character. That's, that's not unique to Jesus. That's true of you and I. If I were to describe myself to you, and I could say, well, I'm a man, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, I'm a son, I'm a brother. I'm a pastor. I like cookies. And so the, you know, we could just kind of go through and each thing is like, oh, okay, there's a little bit more about who I am. In the same way, God wants us to understand him. And so different terms are used in order to help us understand something about his character. Here in, in verse 14 of John chapter 1, there's a very interesting term used to describe Jesus. Jesus is called the word. The word. Now, Words are designed to take invisible ideas or concepts and, in a sense, make them visible. We, 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 it's impossible for someone to know what you're thinking until you communicate what you're thinking. In our marriage relationships, don't we have problems with that? We have problems with we have an expectation that our spouse knows what we're thinking without our communicating it, and it creates some sort of trauma. We, the only way for my invisible ideas to, in a sense, become visible is for me to open my mouth and speak them. Does that make sense? So we have the invisibility of God or the, the distance, the unknowableness of God, and that is made known to us in the person of Jesus Christ. God spoke to us in the sending of his son. And so John says, he says, the word the visible presence of God became flesh, and he says, and then he dwelt among us. He lived with us, and John says, and we beheld his glory. That word beheld, what's a synonym for the word beheld? What's a synonym for that? See, or in past tense would be saw. We saw the glory of God when we looked at Jesus. We looked at Jesus and we saw what God was like. And then John tells us the first thing, the thing that struck him most about God when he encountered Jesus. Verse 14, he says, We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace. When, when I saw Jesus... That was the visible expression to humanity of the invisible God. And when I met him, I realized God is a God of grace. Now, grace is a, a like a, we might say it's like a pregnant term. 
It's so full of life. It's, it's one of the biggest theological concepts in your whole Bible. Um, the word grace is a word that might best be just defined by looking at it from two different perspectives. You could look at it from the perspective of the recipient, and you could look at it from the perspective of the giver, right? So we just celebrated the Christmas season. And in the Christmas season, you experienced both, both ideas of that, right? You were the recipient of things, and you were the giver of things. Grace from the perspective of the recipient is unearned favor. You open that package, you're like, oh my gosh, I, like, I, no, this is too much. Like, oh, I don't deserve this. I, you, like, you thought of me and you, you got this. Well, the grace, God's grace in the sense of, the, of, as a recipient, is, God, I don't earn your love. There's nothing that I could do to make you love me, God. It's that unearned favor that we have with God. But maybe a better way to understand grace is not to look at it from the perspective of the recipient, but the perspective of the giver. And in that case, we might define grace this way. Grace is the giving nature of God. That God, by his very nature, is giving. In other words, God looks at humanity and God looks at the human condition and it is in the very nature of God to want to meet humanity in our weakness and provide what's missing. That's the very heart of God. God looks out at humanity. The storyline of the Bible, the storyline of the Bible, it, it unfolds very rapidly. The, opening, the Bible opens introducing us to God. Then we're introduced to man. Then we're introduced to conflict between man and Satan. And we're introduced to sin entering the world. And as the moment that sin enters the world, the grace of God is enacted. And the very moment that sin enters in the world, God enacts a program in order to meet the needs of fallen man by bringing the Savior into the world. Genesis chapter 3, we've already been introduced to the plan of God to redeem humanity back to himself. It's the heart of God to meet the needs of fallen human beings. That's what grace is. Now, this, this grace is something that is, um, is talked about often within Scripture. Listen to some of the uh, adjectives that Bible writers use to describe the grace of God. They refer to it as great grace, abundant grace, abounding grace, spreading grace, exceeding grace, sufficient grace, glorious grace, exceedingly abundant grace, justifying grace, and James calls it more grace. That's just God's grace. We sang about the amazing grace of God. There's actually the, the focal point of heaven is a throne. Whenever, whenever the, that sort of um, veil is removed and we get to look from time into eternity, we get to look into the, the, the heavenly realm, the central focus of heaven is a throne. God is seated upon that throne. He sits upon the throne as both king, he rules over all, and of judge. Everything will be answerable to him. But there's actually one place in the Bible where that throne has its title. That throne has a name. You know, like a, like, like a boat has a name on it? I don't know the rules. I don't know how big a boat has to be before it gets a name, right? Like if you have a Boston whaler, it probably doesn't have a name. But at some point, you put a name on the back of the boat, right? Well, the, the throne of God actually has a name. It's called the throne of grace. And flowing from that, flowing from that are streams of grace. Because God in his very nature looks at the condition of humanity and God wants to meet us in our weakness. I'd like you at this point to turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And as you're turning there, um, Timothy is the pastor of, he's a young man. He's a pastor of a large and tremendously impactful church uh, in the first century. In fact, uh, the, the church in Ephesus is one of three churches in the book of Acts that is a focal point and is set as a pattern. And the church in Ephesus had a tremendous impact upon their whole community for the kingdom of God. And not only did they see numerous people come to saving faith, but they actually saw the culture of Ephesus begin to be transformed. People's lives were changing. The very economy in Ephesus was changing because people were meeting Jesus, embracing kingdom values, changing their lifestyle, and it impacted the culture. This repeated itself in at least seven other communities. 
There are at least seven churches in the New Testament that all birthed out of this church in Ephesus. So it was a tremendous work that God was doing. Like anywhere, the more influence the church has upon the community, the more resistance that ultimately arises from those that are opposed. So here we have Timothy. He's a young man. He's standing in, a, in, in big shoes. He's got a huge responsibility. And, and there are things in that that are causing him to realize his weakness and his inabilities. And we'll take a look. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 reads this way. You, therefore, my son... What's that next phrase? Be strong. Be strong. And he says this. Be strong where? In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Timothy, here's the solution. You're facing this challenge. Here's the solution. You can be strong in the grace that's found in Christ Jesus. Now, this word strong, it's that, it's that, that very well-known Bible word, dunamis, speaking of, the, of the, really the unstoppable power of God. But the form that this word is written in is not a word that's just talking about the strength itself, but it's talking about a person being strengthened by that. There is a difference between something being strong and something have the, having the ability to strengthen you. I, I'll try to illustrate. If you uh, can imagine a time maybe in your life where you've gone down to the beach and the waves are somewhat large and you're in the water and you get hit by a wave and it knocks you over, it reveals to you the strength that's in that wave but does that wave's strength strengthen you or does it expose your weakness? Right? You get knocked over, not, you know, knocked upside down. You can't find the top. You're trying to get air. You're covered in sand. You come out of the water and you're like, I will never enter the ocean again in my life. This is a horrible experience. Right? Now, I actually know people that that, that is their, their experience. I've seen people. I was sitting years ago. I was at Sunset Beach on the north shore of Oahu. The waves were huge. And I watched this woman walk down to the water. And she got what, what she thought was the safe distance from the water. But the waves were so large that they, the force of them was coming up. And it was almost like the, the waves had hands and grabbed her by the ankles. She fell on her back. She got sucked into the waves and flipped over and back up on the beach and back down. And it was just like a, this, it went three times before finally she was able to crawl. She was covered in sand. And I think this woman probably moved to Kansas. <laughs> okay, like this, like, the safe. So you get the idea, like there's strength in that wave, but does that wave have the ability to strengthen her? Here's what this, when Paul says, be strong in the Lord, or be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, the word he uses is saying, actually be strengthened by this strong grace that belongs to God. God's grace has the ability to actually strengthen us in our weakness. Now, I want to suggest, um, I want to basically present a premise. I want to look at it from three angles. The premise is this, that, that the message of Christianity, the message of the Bible, exposes human weakness. It exposes human weakness. The first, the first point in that would be this, the cross or the gospel message exposes human weakness. L listen to the, the, the message of the gospel sounds like this. Paul wrote, by the deeds of the flesh, or um, by the deeds of the law, rather, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Let me say that again since I boggled it up so badly. By the deeds of the law, by the things that you do, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. Let me ask you, according to that verse, how many fleshes can be justified by doing good deeds. How many fleshes? None. No flesh. And the reason for that is the Bible says that we have all sinned. And because we've all sinned, that we are all uh, unrighteous, that there are none who are righteous. Jesus had a, used a vivid um, story to illustrate that. Jesus said this. He said, it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man, the best of men, to get to save themselves. Easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Can you get a camel through an eye of a needle? I think, and it's not like I practice this on a daily basis, but I think it's probably pretty tough to get a 
piece of thread through the eye of a needle. They're putting a camel through the eye of a needle. And so, so the, the, his listeners respond to him and they say, Jesus, who then can be saved? If, if the best of men would be easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than the best of men to be saved, they said, who then can be saved? And Jesus said this, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. What does impossible mean? Now, if you, if you look at social media, you might think that impossible means I'm possible. That's not what it means. That's the exact opposite of what it means, okay? It is the verb possible. It means something can be done with a negative prefix that negates the ability of the verb, okay? It's kryptonite. It negates the verb cannot do what it's asked to do. So the, when the Bible says that it's, when Jesus says with man it's impossible, he's saying man has no means in, of, in and of himself to save himself because our righteousness is not enough. That doesn't mean that man's not capable of doing good things. Man has been created. We're in the image of God. We are image bearers and we are capable even apart from God of doing tremendously good things. There is a character in the Bible who is noted for being a good man. His name is Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman a military officer. The Roman soldiers, by and large, were oppressive to the Jewish people. That was the, the when John the Baptist, you remember the, the, John the Baptist is out speaking and he speaks for a moment to the soldiers. The soldiers say, what should we do? If we're gonna, if we're gonna do what's right, he says, stop oppressing the people. That's what they did, and yet not this guy Cornelius. He didn't act like the rest of the Roman officers. He treated the people well. He invested in his community. He was kind to the, to the people of Israel. And, a, and an angel came and visited him. And this angel says to him, he says, you need to summon a man by the name of Peter. And Peter will come tell you what you need to do, Cornelius. So he sends guys down. They bring Peter to his house. And Peter comes into his house. And Peter looks at Cornelius, this good man, and he says this, he says that whoever believes in the name of Jesus will have his sins remitted. What you need to do, Cornelius, is you need to trust in Jesus. So here's the first premise. The, the message of the gospel exposes human weakness. But the message of the gospel is met by the, or, or the weakness of man is met by the strong grace of God. Even though I can't save myself, what has God done? God's made salvation available to everyone. Paul wrote to Titus and he said, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God's salvation, God's grace is so big that all of humanity can, be, can respond to it. Paul said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the book of Revelation, we have the, we have the fast forward into where human history is going. And in the book of Revelation, there are scenes, there are more than one of them, there are scenes where we see innumerable people before the throne of God. Listen to this one. This is from Revelation 5. It says, they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Here's what that's saying. That's saying that human weakness incapable of saving ourselves was met by the strong grace of God at the cross. And this grace was so strong that from every tribe and every people and every nation and every tongue, people have called upon the name of the Lord and there are innumerable people standing in heaven before the throne of God whose human weakness met strong grace and they were saved. That's powerful, isn't it? Jesus believed this grace was so strong that he commissioned a handful of people who were filled with inability, and he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go to every people group. The, the, the word when it, when it says to make disciples of every nation, the word nation is the Greek word ethnos. It means of every ethnicity in the whole world. Go everywhere and make disciples of every nation. And Jesus said this on another occasion. He said, the gospel of this kingdom must be preached to the whole world as a testimony, and then the end will come. He believed that this grace was so strong that by a handful of people with all of their inabilities, that when they proclaimed that message all over the world, people would come to faith in Christ. 
Isn't that amazing? And this grace is not just something that is, is like for the whole world, but it's something for each of us. Not only does the Bible say, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but the Bible says this, if you, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Isn't that amazing? Human weakness meets strong grace. Here's our second point. Our second point is, is that our attempts to walk with Jesus expose our weakness. Remember the story when uh, Jesus comes to Peter and he says, uh, he says, Peter, all of you are going to be made to stumble because of me. And Peter says, no way, Lord. Not me. I'll never stumble. All these guys might deny you, but I would die for you, Jesus. And I believe that Peter was sincere. Peter's not lying. He really, really would. He, he's like, I'll die for you, Jesus. I left everything to follow you, Jesus. I'm committed to you, Jesus. He wanted to do what was right. But then we follow the storyline a little bit, and they go into a garden. Jesus commissions them to pray. He goes farther into the garden, and he comes back. And these men that have been commissioned by him to pray, what are they doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. And Jesus comments on it. He says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak, weak, human weakness. You had a desire. Peter, you want to do the right thing. And, I, and, and very often in my Christian experience, I, I have that, that same sort of desire that Peter expresses. I think, Lord, I want to be pleasing to you. But then things expose my weakness. I want to be pleasing to Jesus in my private life, a part of my life that nobody else knows about, and I find myself struggling. And I want to be pleasing to Jesus in my married life with a person I love more than anyone else on the planet. And yet I say things or do things that hurt her feelings. And I want to, I want to be pleasing with my children. Do, let me ask you, does raising children expose human weakness? <laughs> there might be nothing more exposing than that. You, you know, you want... My, my wife, um, our oldest son, he's an, he, he, was a, he was a... If we go backward, he's an amazing adult. He was a good kid. He was a tough toddler, right? I mean, just challenging. And at one point, my wife looked at him and she said, you are turning me into someone I never wanted to be. <laughs> now, again, it's not his fault. It's just that, that that challenge of raising him exposed the weakness that was in her. And so we have these things. We, we want to do what's right. We want to, you know, at the workplace or within the community, and, and we want to do the right thing, but interaction with others and the, and, and the, way, the way people treat us, and we, we find ourselves just failing over and over and over again. Our attempts to follow Jesus expose our weakness. And what they're actually exposing to us is that there are elements of our relationship with Christ that have not been developed in us yet. Hey, so, if, so if I'm agitated by the way you are acting towards me or reacting to me, then it's revealing that there's something that has not yet been developed in me. I'm missing something. There, that's like God's exposing. Okay, well, this is the work that I need to do in your life. There's an element of, of patience or of kindness or of, or of love or of mercy that's missing within me. In my private life, if I stumble into an area of sin, there's an element of sanctification or personal holiness or, or desiring to be pleasing to God in all things that hasn't yet been developed in me. So it's exposing my weakness. Now listen, the human weakness exposed that we can't save ourselves is met at the cross. I call in the name of the Lord and I'm saved. Where do we go to experience strong grace when... Life is showing us that there are things missing in us. Jesus put it like this. Jesus said, I'm the vine, and you're the branches. And if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. That's where you go. We abide in Jesus. Take a look at our text again here in 2 Timothy. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice, Paul says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say, Timothy, you know what you need to do? You just need to be stronger. Just be stronger. Imagine, imagine being in the weight room. You've got, a, you've got you know, the barbell. You've got weights on it. You're laying on the bench press and dropped it down onto your chest, and you're pushing with all of your might, and it's not moving. In fact, it's moving. It's moving down, okay? 
and it's not going to, and, and somebody comes up to you and you go, be stronger. Is that going to help? To me, that would be like someone telling you to be taller. Okay? Oh, you can't reach that. Just be taller. That's all you need. And you go, that, that's, that doesn't help me. Paul doesn't say, Timothy, you need to dig down deep and be stronger. He says, uh, Timothy, you need to learn how to access the grace of God that will meet you in the weakness that your circumstances has exposed to you. And that is met in learning how to abide in Jesus. Lean into Jesus. If, if things in your life right now, whether it's private life, whether it's family life, whether it's community life, whatever, whatever it is, are exposing things of weakness in you, the solution is leaning into Jesus. You just realize, I, I need to grow more. I need more time with you. Jesus, you, you see this is missing. Would you work this into my life? Learn, just develop that time of just learning how to sit in the morning with Jesus, with your Bible, talking with him, asking him to infuse who he is into who you're not. Last thing, as we wrap this up, and uh, that is that, that our attempts to serve Jesus also expose human weakness. If you, you'll notice that any time you try to serve the Lord, it's kind of like a mirror. And, and that ministry opportunity will reflect back to you your own weakness. And we see that throughout the Bible. Every, characters are, are invited by God to participate with him in the work that he wants to do. And those Bible characters often resist it. Moses is a, is a classic example. There's at least six times where Moses is resisting what God is asking him to do. And Moses was an, an incredibly accomplished individual. He was, he was uh, uh, well-educated. He had great experience. He was multicultural. He was multilingual. He, I mean, he was tremendously gifted. And yet, what God was asking him to do exposed the weakness that was in Moses, but that weakness was met by God's strong grace. And the same thing is true for you and I. You have a sense that, that God is asking you to participate with him in the work that he wants to do, and you step into that, and immediately it begins to show your weakness. I could give a, an illustration, a very simple, but imagine if you were to leave here and go out somewhere in the public. So you go to somewhere for lunch, or you go shopping, and in that setting, you sense that God tells you, to go share the Lord with a perfect stranger. That moment, your weakness is exposed. Suddenly, your head is filled with voices telling you all the reasons why that's a really dumb idea. Right? You can't do that. You don't know what to say. What if they ask you this? <laughs> As if this person is the deepest theological thinker that's ever lived on the planet, and they're going to ask you a question you can't answer. But all those things race through our brains. It exposes our weakness. Now, listen. The, the strong grace of God in the cross meets human weakness and we can be saved. The strong grace of God is met in abiding in Christ and things that don't exist in us are produced in us as we follow Jesus. And listen, the strong grace of God is met by the outpouring of his spirit to equip us to do what he asks us to do. Last point and we'll wrap. In the Christmas story, you remember when the angel comes to Mary? And the angel says, Mary, you're going to have a child. This child is going to be a king. He's going to sit upon a throne, and he's going to rule over a kingdom that has no end. And Mary, if I can just imagine. Imagine any parent, and an angel comes and says, your child's going to be a king. And you're like, I knew it. I knew it. My child's so smart. Like, he started crawling. He was only four months or whatever. You know, like we, like, like we all think our children, are, I mean, my grandsons are, but, but we all think like they're super special. Like somehow humanity has been altered in this one. And all this potential, right? I mean, that's what we think. Imagine an angel coming to you and saying, your child is good. You say, Mary does not respond to that. She doesn't say, a king? Really? My son? Oh, I knew it. She says, how can this be? I've never known a man. What God was asking her to do is impossible. It was impossible because she was a virgin. She says, how? Lord, this is impossible. What you're asking is impossible. I can't do that. You're calling me to participate in the work that you're doing in the world, and I can't do it. And God responds to her. He says, Mary, the Spirit of God will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. And then in essence, he says, 
and the promise of God will be fulfilled in you. It's the same thing that's true for you and I. God's asking you. He wants you. He loves you. He's thinking about you. He wants you to participate in the work that he wants to do in furthering the gospel in this community. And he's inviting you to participate. And that invitation exposes weakness in you. And the solution to that is the Spirit of God will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. And the promise of God will be fulfilled in you. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And as we consider, I just want to first of all invite you that perhaps you've never made a decision to commit your life to Jesus Christ, or maybe you've wandered from him. And, and this morning, if you'd be interested in just saying, you know what, I, I want to follow Jesus. I want to return to Jesus. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up right where you're sitting? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? If you raise your hand right where you're seated, I want to ask you just quietly to, to pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. I pray that you would forgive me of my sin. I pray that your strong grace would save me. I pray that you'd help me to, to learn to walk with you and to love you. We just thank you. If you prayed that prayer, we just want to know God's going to do a tremendous work in your life. I want to ask a second question, eyes closed, heads bowed. And that is perhaps this week, has exposed to you areas of weakness, whether in your private life, your family life, or in your attempts to serve the Lord. And you just say, I just need a fresh work of God's Spirit in my life. Just ask God to pour His Spirit out upon me. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up? Just say, would you pray for me? And would you just keep your hand up for a moment while I pray? Lord, you see our hands. You know our hearts. You know the things that have caused us to lift this hand. And Lord, we're just asking for a fresh work of your spirit. We're asking you, Lord, to fill us again with the power of God that would meet us in our human weakness and help us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you're, amen. you're, you're the child. You, you're in charge. Jim. Yes.